Okay, I think we can all agree that the hardest thing about starting a new hobby, learning something new, or just diving into a new area of study in general, especially something as intimidating as a science or a STEM field, um, it's just starting. <laughs> it can be really intimidating to get into paleontology, especially because of all of the scientific words. The nomenclature that these, the Latin terms, can get pretty confusing pretty quickly. But I'm excited that you guys are here to talk a little bit about dinosaurs and paleontology in general. Now, I'm no paleontologist. I would say I'm a hobby paleontologist. <laughs> just simply your museum educator and field trip guide today. These field trips are for anyone, all ages, and I am super excited, wherever you're watching this from, that you're here with me today. Hi guys, I'm super excited that you guys were able to join me today on our field trip. It's a really exciting one today. I'm personally super excited. It's just right behind me today. We're visiting the Natural History Museum of Utah, located just outside of Salt Lake City, nestled in the foothills of the Wasatch Mountains. This museum has an amazing fossil collection, so we're gonna learn a lot about reconstructions that artists do. My favorite dinosaur, at least my favorite dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period. I am super excited. It's gonna be super awesome. It is absolutely beautiful out today. Today's a perfect day for a field trip. It's gorgeous. I'm not even inside the museum yet. I'm just going up the trails kind of around the building and it is beautiful. If I haven't emphasized enough, I really love this museum. Today's gonna be super fun. We're gonna see a lot of exhibits, learn a lot. I have a couple of really good book recommendations if anyone's interested. We also have an interactive activity. So if you wanna follow along, here's what you're gonna need. I'm gonna go back to, to looking over Salt Lake City. Okay, if you wanna follow along with our interactive activity, all you're gonna need is a piece of paper, a pen or pencil, and then colors if you'd like to add color. Another really cool thing about this museum is the architecture of the building itself. It's made out of copper and it follows kind of that natural curve of the mountains. So it doesn't stick out when you're driving through and I don't know, I just think it's a really awesome touch. Okay, I'm just outside the main entrance of the Natural History Museum of Utah and I'm getting ready to go inside. Looks like it's about our time to head inside, so let's go. This museum is located on the University of Utah campus, so you of you students are able to get in for free. You guys were able to get in for free with me today since you're riding along in my field trip, so let's go. The museum is in a beautiful spot and it's obvious that they know that. As you walk in, you're greeted with a sweeping view of the valley and the city and some beautiful architecture already. We haven't even gone in yet. Thank you. Beautiful. Looks like we got all of our tickets scanned. When you first walk in, there's a couple different ways you can go throughout the museum, but we're going to head directly to the Past Worlds exhibit. This is what we're going to be focusing on today. Before we head right in, we're going to stop and take a look at the fossil preparators. I wanted to wave at them, but they seem hard at work, so I'm going to let them do their jobs. Okay, before we head into the main area where the fossils are, we're going to come across a couple of these displays. Now, the animals and their environments have been recreated. They're super awesome. You guys are going to be able to reconstruct your own animals, so get excited. As we're looking through some of these reconstructions of both the animals and their environments, we're going to go into our interactive activity right now. You're more than welcome to follow along. I'd love to see these when you're finished, so if you'd like, you can post that, tag me on Instagram. I'll put all that information in the description down below. Artists will collaborate with paleontologists um, in order to reconstruct what they think that these dinosaurs would look like. Now these aren't perfect. There's a limit of what we know about dinosaurs. Obviously we know a lot, especially with new advancements in technology. We're learning a lot more than we ever have. If you want to know a little more about how we know what we know about dinosaurs, I'd really recommend this book. It's called Dinosaurs Rediscovered. The Scientific Revolution in Paleontology. I picked this up at my local library. Now artist reconstructions of animals aren't perfect. It's gonna be a little bit of guesswork, a little bit of art, and a little bit of science. Uh, so they all kind of work together to, to create a picture or a diagram or painting, whatever the medium is, of what they think that that animal would look like in its environment. This is why I love museums. Everyone learns a little bit differently. I'm more of a visual learner, so I love when exhibits have all of these elements kind of together. We can really sense that emotion, that feeling. We can see what that dinosaur would look like. Its environment just makes you feel like you're walking with this dinosaur millions of years ago. It's amazing. Like I said, reconstructions aren't gonna be perfect. Here's a great example. This is one of my favorite books right now. It's called The Walking Whales from Land to Water in 8 Million Years by Dr. Hans Thewissen. Super awesome. Here's kind of a good example of a reconstruction. 
where the artist doesn't have all of the information. So sometimes paleontologists aren't able to find complete arms, legs, tails um, of these animals. So artists have to be a little bit creative. So here's an example of an Eocene whale. I'll put the name on the screen here so I don't mispronounce it. But if you look at some of these renditions, can you guess what they weren't able to find? This whale's feet were never found. They might be in the future, but for now we don't have them. And the paleontologist didn't want them to just guess. So they gave the artist some, some freedom and some creativity to depict these animals as best they could in their natural environment. I think they're beautiful, but as you can see, it doesn't show their legs. This is an awesome book. Again, I recommend this super highly. I finished it in about a week. It's amazing. So for our interactive activity, I want you to grab your paper. I want you to grab your pencil. If you have colors, you're more than welcome to grab your colors. I'm going to put my skeleton right up here that I hypothetically found. We're going to call me Dr. Addison, paleontologist. I dug this dinosaur up. I want you guys to reconstruct what you think it would look like. Let's see, my dinosaur has a short snout, long legs. It's gonna walk on land and it's gonna breathe air. Um, I'm not sure if it has fur or not, what color that is. Um, I think it eats fish, so I think it lives around freshwater or saltwater. We found both. Um, we haven't found any of the feet bones, but we know it has long legs. Um, so do your best to reconstruct what you think that looks like. Again, I'll keep the skeleton up here if you guys want to take a look. I'd love to see your renditions of my dinosaur. We're going to call it the, the Adasaurus, okay? After me. I found it, okay? <laughs> so go ahead and draw what you guys think that'll look like while we go through the rest of this field trip, okay? All right, I'm excited to see the Adasaurus in the flesh. While you're working on that, we're going to round the corner away from the displays and into the main fossil area. You guys, this is what we've been waiting for. This area is amazing. Just the way that it's set up is just beautiful. It feels like you round the corner and come face to face with a different dinosaur around each turn. It is amazing. They have a beautiful selection of Triceratops skeletons and skulls, so let's get into it. Now, this museum is especially amazing for someone who loves Triceratops triceratops because of the amazing triceratops skull display that they have it's amazing to see the triceratops lined up like that because it shows that they weren't just an old fossil that you know is one cookie cutter size they were a living breathing species with families and herds and it's just amazing to see them represented in that kind of way so triceratops is my favorite dinosaur from the late cretaceous period it's just so cool i don't know how it's not everyone's favorite dinosaur i mean it's obviously pretty popular but <laughs> what's funny is that the triceratops is found in the late cretaceous period so that's about 60 to 80 million years ago it's actually not found in the Jurassic um, era. So Jurassic Park kind of got basically all of the dinosaurs wrong. Um, the T-Rex wasn't even found in the Jurassic period. It was all the dinosaurs, the most popular ones that we kind of recognize and identify now were found in the late Cretaceous period. Um, the Jurassic period was about 100 million years earlier. So if they had the Allosaurus as the main villain of Jurassic Park, it would make a lot more sense because that was the main predator of, of the Jurassic period, but I digress. The Triceratops is really cool. It's a vegetarian, so it's only going to eat plants. It doesn't eat meat, but it's in the shape of a heavily armored tank. The Triceratops is probably one of the major dinosaurs that would scare the T-Rex if it got a whiff of it. Even though it's a vegetarian, dinosaurs knew not to mess with this Triceratops. Now the Triceratops would be about 10 feet tall, weigh anywhere from four to six tons. Comparing that to a T-Rex, a T-Rex would probably be double the height. So while the T-Rex is gonna be about double the height of that Triceratops, they're gonna weigh basically the same amount. The difference between the two is how that weight is distributed and how those dinosaurs were able to use that weight and all that mass to their advantage. T-Rex stand on two legs, while Triceratops walk on four. So our T-Rex has those strong legs that it balances on, has those little tiny arms that don't really do anything, a strong tail, and then a really powerful bite. Our Triceratops is gonna walk on four legs. It's kind of a mixture between a rhino that has straight legs in the back and a lizard, which arms come, come out to the side and they kind of shuffle. So a Triceratops back legs are gonna be similar to that of a rhino or an elephant where they're going to be straight down and its front arms are going to be splayed a little bit out to the side like a lizard. Go ahead and try out the different positions of how a t-rex would stand just on two legs and then how a triceratops would stand on those four legs. Obviously when you're on those four legs all that weight is going to be pushing forward. That's kind of where that triceratops takes advantage. It uses all of that weight pushing forward to use that head plate and those frills to ram into opponents, to ram into sometimes other triceratops. Obviously the triceratops has a really specialized 
head, head plate, and horns. Those are the most recognizable elements of the Triceratops, right? So you might think that that head plate and that frill is what it's called, kind of like the frill of lace on a dress or skirt. You might think that that is just to run into things, which it was, but it was most important to protect the Triceratops most vulnerable place. Because the T-Rex is gonna be twice the size of the Triceratops, it's gonna come above that Triceratops and try to clasp onto its neck, which is the most vulnerable position, especially when you're walking on four legs. That head frill is able to protect that neck of the Triceratops, and as that T-Rex tries to chomp on it, they're not gonna get through it. The Triceratops head plate is gonna be about six times thicker than a human skull. So it's gonna be about this thick. It'll be hard to bite through, even for a T-Rex. Another cool fact about the Triceratops is that is the horns coming out of their face. So unlike rhinos or elephants where their horns are made of keratin or ivory they're more similar to deer where the horns coming out are just pure bone so it's just straight bone coming directly out of their face so that makes them really strong so basically let's put that into perspective if a triceratops was just walking walking down the street and your car was on the side of the road if it turned its head to look at you it could slice directly through that car without even trying <laughs> it's pretty amazing that they have adapted to basically fight off nature's biggest predators at the time. I think it's awesome. All they want to do is eat flowers and <laughs> hang out in the sun, but you got to do what you got to do, you know? I love it. <laughs> All right, back in the museum, we're going to go past some more amazing fossils. Every time I'm here, I'm drawn to this giant crocodilian looking creature. It's just amazing every time I see it. We're also going to go past a display of some Pleistocene animals. The Pleistocene epoch was anywhere from 50 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. So these animals lived alongside the earliest humans. So the saber-toothed tiger, the mammoth, the giant sloth. It's just crazy to think that if you were born 10,000, 20,000 years earlier, you'd be hanging out with these animals. Okay, the rest of the museum is obviously beautiful. There's so many beautiful gems, minerals, plants, animals on display. I always love looking at the minerals. There's an area where you can look at them under a different colored light as well. I also didn't realize that they just opened up a new exhibit about Angkor, a Cambodian civilization. So we're absolutely going to have to come back to this museum for another field trip. Don't you worry, we are going to come back. Thank you guys so much for coming with me on a field trip to the Natural History Museum of Utah. I'm super excited to come back and check out the Angkor exhibit that they just opened. I didn't even know they opened it, so I'm super excited. We'll definitely have to come back here for another field trip. Thank you so much for joining me and for taking the first step in learning something new or branching out into a new area. It's again, the hardest part is starting. So I'm really proud of you guys. Thank you for coming. Again, I'll link my Instagram page in the description. So I'd love to see your reconstructions of the Atosaurus, okay? <laughs> Thanks for coming and I'll see you guys next time.